Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. But even if we get a Game 70, you know what else is next week? The NBA draft. Hard to believe the NBA draft. It feels like for a certain segment of the basketball population, like the NBA draft, full speed ahead, everybody's talking about it. I do think in coming years, AT Media, myself, some of the guys that work with me will cover the draft more extensively. But they're just, it's going to sneak up on us. The NBA draft is on its way. We are, again, about 10 days away from the NBA draft. And I will say this, more than any question about the NBA draft, I'm actually getting one question more than any other. And it has nothing to do with the number one pick. And it has nothing to do with Jabari Smith or Chet Holmgren or Paolo Bancaro. It has to do, instead, with the international man of mystery that literally no one knows anything about and no one is quite sure what to make of. And that is Shaden Sharp. And more than any other question, I continue to get asked about Shaden Sharp. Would you draft him? Would you not? Where would you draft him? How high would you draft him? Are you worried about the foul? Oh, there are a million questions about Shaden Sharp, but the number one question that I've gotten in draft season is, Torres, if you were an NBA GM, would you draft him? Some people are talking about him as high as number four. Some people are talking about him falling a little bit deeper in the draft. So let's get into it because I think it's the most fascinating question of the draft. It has a little bit of backstory. I think everybody knows the Shaden Sharp deal at this point. But I will say it is one of the most fascinating stories that I can ever remember in covering basketball, the draft, you name it in general. This was the kid. We talked about him a lot on this show. So for those of you who listen to this show regularly, I apologize that we just keep talking about this kid. But I think everybody kind of remembers the deal at this point. But the number one high school player in the class of 2022 really had a great summer last year, ascended to the number one spot. In September, commits to Kentucky. Um, and it really is the cornerstone of what is expected to be a top two, top three recruiting class in all of college basketball. Then just a few weeks after that, he announces, oh, whoa, 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 wait a second now. I know I was the number one player in the class of 2022, but I am going to reclassify and show up at Kentucky and play this year. Now, the idea behind it, the idea that was shared publicly by his team and the people that are around him was that he was not going to play this year. He was going to spend all of this year training and that he was going to prepare for the 2022-2023 season where he would likely be the face of, if not one of the two faces along with Oscar Shibway, excuse me, still got a little tickle in my throat here, of the number one team in college basketball. Just one problem. After showing up at Kentucky, after not playing a single minute, all of a sudden, in the middle of the spring... A document shows up showing that he actually graduated from high school last year, which makes him eligible for this NBA draft. And because of it, he announced that he is going to enter the NBA draft without playing a single second of basketball at Kentucky. And that is why he has instantaneously become the single most fascinating player in this NBA draft. It's because literally no one knows anything about him. One... He really hasn't played all that many competitive games really on any sort of major stage. Again, he was a late-blooming prospect in the class of 2022, reclassifies, doesn't play high school basketball this year, so he doesn't even go through the all-star circuit with the McDonald's game and the Jordan you know, brand classic and the Hoop Summit and all that. Then he goes to college and doesn't play there either. So every, you know... We as draft analysts, you as fans, but also NBA front offices have nothing else to go off of other than a couple YouTube tapes. But then on top of that, this is the part that's especially crazy. Not only has he not played, because he was kind of protected from the media at Kentucky for obvious reasons, I don't blame him as much as the adults around him, and not the adults like John Calipari, the adults in, in his inner circle. We don't even know why he didn't play. Like, that's the crazy part. It's one thing if he just didn't play. But we don't even know why he didn't play. 
Did he want to play and Kentucky didn't let him? Did he want to play and the adults around him didn't want him to play? Did he not want to play? Is he afraid of the competition? Uh, Did he not feel that he was ready? Was he protecting his draft stock? There are a million reasons and nobody knows anything. And I'll say this. I was at the Pangos All-American camp last week. For people who don't know, it's one of the top high school events in all of high school and and, and AAU basketball. NBA scouts are allowed there. And like I said, they have as many questions about this kid as you do. I think we all think that, you know, myself as a pseudo-media member, you guys as fans, well, the NBA must know the truth. The NBA has no idea either. And what I would say about Shane and Sharp definitively I know there's some real buzz that he could go as high as number four in this draft to the Sacramento Kings, who are currently projected in the four spot. They could always trade out. I will tell you from being at Pango's camp with a bunch of NBA people, there are a lot more questions publicly from the NBA side of things than I think a lot of people realize. Again, it's not just us that have questions. It's NBA people as well, and I could see the scenario. Where people just say, you know what, I'm not taking a chance on this kid. I know nothing about him. I don't know if he wants to compete. I don't know how. T- I don't even know how good that he is. Why he didn't play? I'm gonna let. I'm gonna let somebody else take a chance on him. I don't think he's falling number 25, but I could see the scenario where he falls to nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And so it goes back to the fundamental question: Would you draft him, Aaron? And I think it's complicated, right? It's like the old Facebook status. It's complicated. There isn't a definitive yes or no. There isn't a definitive like Paolo Bancaro, like Jabari Smith in the NFL, like Aiden Hutchinson. like like, like It's not just a simple yes or no question. Because what I would say is like, on the one hand, the talent is unquestionably there. If you've never seen film of this kid, I mean, he is absolutely just a phenomenal physical freak of all physical freaks when it comes to basketball. Six foot five, six foot six, can beat people off the dribble can attack the rim, great, you know, looking three-point shot. We don't know how it translates to a game. Smooth shots, I I mean, I'm talking 1% of 1% of 1% as an athlete. And the thing about the NBA, which we all know, nobody drafts a finished product. Nobody drafts a guy expecting the guy to come in and be everything that he is ever going to be in year one or year two. And so if you believe in that talent then I don't see a problem with drafting him at four, drafting him at five, drafting him at six, because the upside is as good as anybody that is available in this draft. And we all know at the end of the day, the NBA draft is all about talent. It's all about upside. It's all about what an organization believes that they can build you into. But what I would also say is, like I said, it's complicated. It's not as simple as just, well, he's got a lot of upside. Let's take a chance on him. Because What I think NBA team and what I know NBA teams are trying to figure out right now is what's between the ears and what are you getting if you draft this kid when he shows up? First of all, it is worth noting, even before this fiasco over the last couple months shows up at Kentucky, says he's going to play, says he's not going to play, says he's coming back for 2022, 2023, even before all that, I can tell you that there were questions about this kid's motor the second that he got to campus. Now, I am not as big of a, you know, if a guy doesn't have a motor in high school, just just throw him to the scrap heap and give up on him. Because I do think some guys are so naturally gifted at the high school level that they do get bored. I mean, I remember seeing DeAndre Ayton in high school, and the problem with him, the knock on him at the time, was that he had no motor. Then he goes to Arizona. He's playing against much better competition, and he is just a physical freak, you know, blocking shots, rim running. Um, you know, Arizona, by the, by the time of uh, the year that he was there, by the end of the year, they were maybe the best team in the country, even though they lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And so I'm not a big like, well, he has no motor. He doesn't care. Like, I do think sometimes guys are so physically gifted that they get bored. But I will say Shane Sharp's a little bit different. I mean, DeAndre Ayton played a full year of college basketball, put Arizona on his back, led him to a Pac-12, I believe, regular season title, certainly a Pac-12 championship they were one of the probably the two, three best teams in the country, even though they lost early in the tournament. And I think to me, that's where it gets interesting with Shaden Sharp and why this is complicated. I don't think there's a definitive, you can't draft him before here, or if he falls to you, you have to draft him here. I think what it takes is you better have some really smart people in your front office, and if you get one-on-one time with him, 
you better ask some really tough questions. Remember, the, the NBA combine, NBA draft combine was about three weeks ago in Chicago. And I will tell you this. If I was a GM that was potentially in position to draft Shaden Sharp, I would have the most aggressive line of questioning for him that I possibly could. First of all, why didn't you play? What happened there? Was it Cal's fault? Was it your parents' fault? Did people not want you to jump in in the middle of a season? Did they not want you to jump in in the middle of the game? Was there a moment in time where you believed that you were going to play and someone decided it was not in your best interest? Did you decide it was not in your best interest? And by the way, I'll defend Shane Sharp. There are good reasons why he couldn't or shouldn't have played this past year that could have to do with him and a decision that he made. I mean, I do understand the idea of protecting your draft stock. I do understand the idea of not being physically ready, not being emotionally ready, not being a guy who shows up in January and gets thrown into the fire in the SEC when your teammates have been together playing together since the previous May. I mean, the 2021-2022 Kentucky basketball team reported to campus at this time last year. And so I understand if Shane Sharp just said, look, they had a good thing going. Yes, there were some injuries, but we knew everybody was coming back. I just felt like it wasn't in my best interest. But again, if I'm an NBA team, why didn't you play? Was that your decision? Was it Calipari's decision? We hear it's not Calipari's decision, so it must have been yours. Was it the adults in your life? Oh, by the way, who were those adults? We all know of the stories of the, the famed AAU coach that kind of was pulling the strings behind the scenes, Dwayne Washington. Was he the guy? I need answers. I need to know right now. And oh, by the way, how involved is he going to be? If we send you down to the G League, are you not playing there? If we bring you off the bench, are you not playing there? Are you only playing if you're guaranteed a certain amount of minutes? What role is this guy going to have? Like, these are the questions that NBA teams are asking right now, and this is why I believe this is the most fascinating prospect in the NBA draft. Because he might have the highest upside of anybody, but we literally don't know anything. We've never seen a scenario quite like this before. We've seen guys not play. We've seen guys coming off injuries. We've seen guys even, you know, last year with Jalen Johnson at Duke opted out of the season. But that was late in the year. That was when he had already put together enough of a resume where it, it was what it was at that point. It was COVID. It was different. This year, this kid shows up. There's reports that he wanted to play, that Calipari wanted to play him, that, his fam that, that the, the, the adults around him wouldn't let him. And so that is why this is so fascinating because, one, we have no film on him at all. We have no idea what happened, but we also don't know why he didn't play. Was it his decision? Was it Calipari's? Was it the adults in his life? Were they protecting his draft stock? Did they not feel that he was ready? Did they not feel that he was the right fit? Did they really believe at any point that they were actually coming back for the 2022-2023 season? And to reiterate, and we'll get out of here on this, I just want to reiterate to you guys and girls. I'm telling you, I talked to NBA people last week. It's not just me as, as, as a, a lover of college basketball in the NBA draft. It's not just you guys as fans that followed him in college. It's not just you guys as fans that may have interest in him as a prospect that your team would draft. It's NBA people that are asking these questions as well and trying to get answers of these questions as well. My guess is that John Calipari's phone is blowing up off the hook this week. And I'd be very curious to, <laughs> I'd love to, you know, you talk about those old FBI wiretaps. I'd love to get a wiretap on Calipari's phone and see what he really has to say about the Shaden Sharp deal. It is fascinating. But when I tell you that me, you, fans are not the only people that are trying to get to the bottom of this, I guarantee you there are a lot of people in NBA circles that are trying to get to the bottom of this as well.